Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and, um, and uh, recognise the past and present leaders of this, um, of this land. Um, Matthew, thank you for that. You've, you've done my presentation, so I'm not exactly sure what to present from here, but um, <laughs> we'll see how we go. And I love this podium. I feel like I'm about to say the gospel according to SNOP. So, so please listen. So I'd like to share with you the journey that um, Telstra has been on for the past two years uh, with GRA in implementing SNOP um, at Telstra. But firstly, I'd like to actually just tell you a little bit about Telstra because we're a bit of an unknown brand, so I just need to, I guess, sh share a little bit about Telstra. And hopefully a button works here. Ah, excellent. All right, here we go. All right, well, Telstra, we have been connecting families, friends and businesses with a little bit of a couple of telemarketers for the past 31 years. But our history stems a lot further than that. In 1900 was the first time the Postmaster General's Department um, started up with the telco industry. Now, to put that in perspective, our government has only been operating since 1901. So we're about a year older than our government. So if you think about change management and SNOP with change management, Telstra is older than our government. Now, you might say to me, yes, but Carly, look at how much change our government has had lately, and surely Telstra can you know, get along on board. And the answer is, is yes. So, um, so let me take you through that. Um, so we've been the leading telco in Australia since we've begun. We did have an unfair advantage um, in the start, uh, but one of the leading telcos in the world brings along a lot of responsibility. We currently support uh, over 30,000 Australian employees uh, in Telstra and many other contractors as well. And um, we are, uh, well, our, our history really stems in government as well. So we've got a lot of history and a lot of, I guess, stable um, employee working there. So our total income that was reported in the annual report last year was um, $29 billion. So there's a lot of opportunity there and there's a lot of savings and, we, and we've been able to, um, to, to tap into some of those savings. Now before I start to get into our journey, I just wanted to invite Luke up just to uh, introduce GRA as well. Thank you, Carly. Uh, and thank you, Mike, for that introduction. It was almost as if I writ it myself. Um, neglected to mention the thing about being Claire Bachelor of the Year, but that's okay, we'll <laughs> next time. Um, <laughs> there's probably a need to introduce GRA a little bit more than Telstra. Unfortunately, we can't claim to have a $29 billion revenue, but um, we probably- You're working on it? We're working on it, yeah. correct. Um, we've got a number of our clients uh, here today, so thank you for attending. But for those who aren't familiar with us, um, we're Australia's leading boutique supply chain consulting firm in Australia. We've got about 50 or so employees and offices in Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra and Sydney. Um, and we've been on, uh, on this journey with Telstra for quite a few years now, as you've heard. So uh, looking forward to talking to you a little bit later in the presentation. So we look after Telstra's retail supply chain. So just to give you a bit of perspective on our supply chain, we have eight channels. We have 250 branded stores, actually a bit more than that. Um, and uh, we supply to over 6,000 stores. But you say, okay, well, yeah, that's, that's all right. But um, of that, um, we have 46 million units that we procure from our suppliers. And, um, and they cover uh, over 6,000 purchase orders and over 50 suppliers. So just to give you a perspective of how complex we're starting to, um, to delve in here. So we have 45,000 pallets delivered into our warehouse and um, we have 8,400 deliveries a year. And, um, 
And we are currently in the process of changing our warehouses. So we're changing from Brightstar to Toll and going through that change management process now, which is a lot of fun. Um, we have a production facility. Now, this production facility is not like what you would think as a production facility. The production facility is um, we have a phone, we have a couple of cables, and we put them in a box. So it's really not all that complex. Or we have some phones and we want to put a SIM card with the phones. We deliver over 3.8 million shipments a year. And um, only 0.62 million of those actually go to our stores. So we've got 2.9 million direct to customers and then we have business orders as well. And um, it makes it quite interesting to measure your KPIs when you have that many and do the root cause analysis of, well, hang on a second, where did we miss this one customer order? It makes it very interesting conversations to have. So I guess I just wanted to give you a bit of a, a scale because when you think of Telstra Retail, you go, yeah, just a couple of phones. She'll be right. Just a couple of modems. How, how wrong could you get that? Um, but then when you actually have a look at this, you say, okay. And then you get the, the actual returns as well. So from that, you get the mo my modem's not working. Oh, my phone has got a cracked screen. Um, can I borrow a phone in the meantime? And, uh, and it means that, that we get quite busy. Um, and uh, it's really good that we're here today because it means I'm out of the hair of my team who are currently in the midst of taking delivery of a few Apple phones. Um, it's just a little launch that happens once a year uh, for us and it's, it's not a very busy time of year, but we, we seem to get around about 18,000 orders um, per day around about this time of year. So it's, um, it's a little busy and exciting. And no, I haven't got one of the new phones and no, we can't get them earlier because I know I've tried. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's a bit about us. That's just a bit about our supply chain and the complexity of it. So then on to SNOP, something that we're all here for. What I've found is really um, gets SNOP working is a reason for change. Because with your stakeholders, there's a lot of people that have got a lot of work on and they say, what do we need to change? What's, what's in it for me? So I'll take you through that. It's the people, it's the stakeholders. Um, it's a continuous journey of stakeholder management. We have had many, many opportunities for that over the, over the launch of SNOP in Australia, and I'll, I'll take you through a bit of that as well. And what I wanted to do was actually take you through the learnings, because I think the, the best thing that I can add to our supply chain community is share the learnings that we've been on so that we can all learn from them. Or maybe be, maybe be a bit kinder on ourselves when we actually face the same learnings internally. And then what I want to do is show you the benefits of what we've achieved so far. Okay, so something helped us a little bit on our change journey. And uh, that would be the national broadband coming in. It would be our share price dropping off the cliff. Um, it would be um, it would be competitors coming in as well. It would be Amazon coming in as well. And you say, okay, something needs to change. And all of a sudden, Telstra's gone, okay, we can't just sit here and do the same thing and expect the same results all the time. We, we have to do something different. We have to look at some ways to do things differently. You would have even heard the recent announcement of Telstra actually um, uh, looking at 8,000 jobs um, to, to actually put Telstra in line a lot more with, um, I guess, industry expectations. And I've got to say, there is nothing better than a change than an announcement like that. So it's created an, it, it's created an excellent platform for us to actually really drive SNOP because people actually want to see the improvements coming through. What we also found is as these improvements um, or as these opportunities presented themselves, there are a number of, I guess, departments within Telstra that were making decisions in isolation. 
And what we did was we grabbed those decisions that were being made in isolation and showed how actually, if you actually include the rest of finance and supply chain and, and channels and products all within the same area to all look at these decisions rather in isolation, then we can make much better decisions. So there was uh, an example that was a particularly large purchase order that, that came across our desk and we went, why, why are we doing this? And then we started to go down into, well, what are the cost benefits of this? And actually did some scenario plannings and presented it back to the business. And it actually changed the way the business looked at um, some of the strategies they were doing. And then they all of a sudden went, oh, wow, actually, you know what? There's a lot of benefit in us actually getting together and actually making these changes. And once people actually started to see that, that really started to drive the efficiencies, it really started to drive the conversations, and it really started to drive the collaboration in between all the different departments. But Telstra is extremely um, complicated. And I, I guess if you look at the traditional model of you have your sales targets and you turn those sales targets and you have your forecast and you compare the gap and you, you see what's going. In Telstra's environment, the sales targets are, are built on activations and connections, so not actually on the units. So we're trying to, to compare the sales targets of something which is in some ways links up to the physical units, but there's no real 100% um, correlation between the two. So that was our first challenge. So we had to say, okay, all right, so how do we get these stakeholders on board when they're focused on connections and services and we're focused on physical units? How do we actually shorten that gap together? And so the way that we did it was we just got a lot of people talking. So we got people talking in the demand reviews, we got people talking in the supply reviews, and we got people talking in the MBRs. And we started to bring in, uh, I guess, business case studies to say, OK, well, these are the proposals that are coming through. This is what we're seeing. And this is the longer term effect on the business if you do that. And I know you say, well, that's kind of fundamental, isn't it, to business? It's, it's not, you know. If you're, if you're steeped in tradition of something that you've done all the time, it, it's not. And it's, and it's been a huge change journey for us. So coming to um, the importance of stakeholders, and I bring this up to you to show you how much change that we've actually had to deal with at the moment. The first one in April 2017, which was the first MBR meeting, these were the key participants of that meeting. Um, within six months, that was the change of the stakeholders. Within another six months, that was the change holders. And now we're just dealing with a whole new bunch of stakeholders, All right? So this is every six months change of the senior executives that we need to have buy into our SNOP process. So if you're talking about the ability to do stakeholder management, this is this is stakeholder management on on Apple, really. Um, and this has been one of the biggest challenges. The best part about it that I can say is that. People have seen their success on this. So the best way to get stakeholders on board is to include them in the successes of what you've been achieving. The key thing is you'll see that there's one smiling face in the corner there, Paul Palavides. Paul, do you want to just stand up for a second here? <laughs> so, so this is Paul. So Paul's my SNOP manager who's been on the SNOP journey the whole way. And, um, and I wanted to see whether or not there was any headhunters on the uh, list before I actually introduced him. Um, but Paul's, Paul's been one of the driving forces and the consistent forces behind our SNOP process the whole way. And the key thing is that what we have done is we have briefed up every single one of these stakeholders before they join the SNOP process. We've taken them through the journey that we've been on. We've taken them through the benefits that we've been on. We take them through what is your role within the SNOP process and what are the key decisions that we require of you in this process? What are the inputs from your people 
within this process and how can you actually make a, a lively contribution to it. The other interesting thing um, that, that we've been quite, um, I guess, careful to do is to make sure that these people don't delegate the meeting at all. Um, and the re and I, you might say, well, why do you do that? The amount of times we've seen people delegating something or bringing along their, their 2IC and all of a sudden it takes the responsibility of them to actually know the subject, to take charge and to make decisions. So we've been very, very poignant to say it is very important for you to be at the meeting to the point where if the chair of the meeting, which is the, the top people there, is not available, then we will even change the meeting date, um, which is, given these executives, is a very, very big call. But what they have learned is that the value that they get out of this meeting, they actually turn up to the meeting and come along. But that's been a really interesting key learning for us. The other thing is um, KPIs. Um, KPIs are extremely important and the, the, the key learning that I've had with the KPIs is that um, forecast accuracy, even though I've lived it, I breathe it, um, everything is around forecast accuracy, improving the forecast accuracy, a lot of these executives have no idea what forecast accuracy is. And I've, the amount of times I've actually tried to explain, this is your forecast accuracy measure, and they go, oh, all right, and, and that's really important. Yes, this is really important. But then, then we started to learn, okay, well, instead of forecast accuracy, how about I say, all right, if you buy too much stock, you're not going to get the money back fast enough for us to actually get the stock, right? So if you tell me to buy too much stock, we're actually, we're going, we're going to have a cash problem. That they get. If I say, if we don't actually buy enough stock, you're actually not going to hit your revenue targets because we won't have the phones to support these plans that you're putting it on, that's what they understand. If we say your net promoter score is not going to be as good because we don't have the modems ready there for you to do the connections, that's what they understand. And so when we're actually talking to the different levels in the different environments within the MBR and so forth, those are the key messages that we put across. And so we say, if we buy, um, buy this product, that's fine, but the amount of money that we'll have tied up in all these phones will mean that our working capital targets are going to be up here and you won't achieve the target that you wanted to achieve and that, that's what they understand. And so we really, really looked at changing the language, and although we might actually have the measures there, what we'll do is we'll actually concentrate on different things in the different meetings, depending on who the stakeholders are and what they understand. And this, I guess, is where we start with the journey going from SNOP to IBP, because then you start turning all the, the targets that you have into financial targets and financial measures. So, what are the key learnings? The first thing is timing. Make sure that there is a reason for change. If you try and implement these things and try and put another meeting in people's diaries and try to get that done without a reason for change, you're going to have a very hard uphill battle. So, and if you don't have a reason for change, create a reason for change. The second one is make sure your key performance indicators are relevant to your stakeholders and take them through it. Um, I think Paul has taken various executives through one KPI around about five times already, but he's still on there. He's still passionate and still going. Pre-brief your stakeholders. These are high executives who have a lot of things on we find what the key issues that are going to be presented in the meetings and we pre-brief them so that they can come into the meeting and not feel like they're on the back foot, so that they have a reply that they can actually give to the other executives when they've been asked things in the meetings. Have the right reporting tools. This is, um, this is such an underestimated um, 
uh, thing. If we if you don't have the right KPIs and the the tools to actually show or demonstrate the scenario planning that you're trying to do, if you don't have the right tools to say, okay, well, um, this is the risk and this is the returns, um, then it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort to reach the same conclusion or you'll just go around in circles and you won't actually reach a conclusion. And data, data, data. Um, I cannot emphasise how important data is and how... Um, I'm only 25, so I wouldn't say grey hairs, but um, that, that we get because we don't have the right data to drive the right outcomes. Um, so make sure you have the right data because otherwise you'll have people in there picking on your data rather than focusing on the key issues. So that's great, and you say, well, yeah, okay, a lot of that's obvious, but what have we actually achieved in the last year? Well, the first thing we've achieved is a 28% reduction on the retail working capital um, in a year? Yep. In a year. So, um, not bad. And um, Sally Rooney, can you please stand up? So, Sally Rooney is my demand planning manager. Once again, no recruiters in this room. Um, but uh, within the past year, she's been able to, with the team, increase forecast accuracy by 20% and improve forecast bias by 60% through this process. Um, we've been able to, within the first six months, we were able to avoid uh, $150 million in uh, decision making. Um, now, then we stopped counting because then it just became BAU. And our team, the supply chain team, had one of the highest engagement scores in the whole of Telstra. There was a question before as well, how do you measure your success of SNOP? Uh, we actually got Gartner to measure us uh, because we, we like benchmarks. And um, within the first year, we got a measure of uh, 2.9 uh, rating. Um, now, remember, we have only just launched this. And Gartner suggested that they've actually never seen such a, a large jump in maturity in such a small amount of time. But I say, you create the need for change, you get people together, you get them working collaboratively, which is what SNOP is all about. You get the results and people want to get on board and then you just keep on going. So it's been a phenomenal journey that we've been on, um, but we haven't been on it alone. We've had the support of GRA along and, uh, and they are still very, very much part of the business and part of the team. And um, the only thing that I haven't been able to do is, is do their uh, performance ratings and, and things like that. Um, but uh, it's with a lot of um, uh, appreciation um, that, um, that I'll, I will hand over um, to Luke to actually take you through, I guess, the fundamentals and the framework that we put through. I, w I more wanted to talk to you about the softer side and he can talk to you about the, uh, the technical side. I hope you can indulge me for a moment. I just wanted to start off with a few quick thank yous. Uh, firstly, thank you to, to Carly, whose ability to navigate Telstra and all those stakeholders is nothing sort of magnificent and I don't think we would have got where we are today. But like Carly, thank you to Paul Pevlides, who has been on the project since day one and his understanding of business processes and systems within Telstra really um, made this process workable. And to a couple of GRA consultants who are here as well, Dan and Adam, who once again were from the project from day one and um, you know, really helped deliver the results. So thanks, guys. So I've got some good news and bad news. Who wants the good news or bad news first? Anyone? Good news? Bad news. Bad news? The bad news is I want to talk to you about SNOP theory. Uh, the good news is my section should be a lot shorter than Carly's. So. <laughs> Uh, why do I want to talk to you about SNOP theory? Well, mainly because it's a sort of topic that makes you very unpopular at parties and barbecues. Um, so where else can you get to do it? But secondly, I think a theme that's coming through today is how SNOP needs to be flexible and responsive, um, and you've got to evolve over time. And having an understanding of some of those fundamentals will allow you to do that, you can't, so, so you don't have to just lift and shift. Okay, so. Carly spoke a little bit about the project Catalyst. Um, you have a very, very large purchase order. We're talking eight figures here. Um, and it was questioned quite rightly, why are we spending this amount of money? 
and then an investigation had to go through to kind of work out was that the right sum to be purchasing. Um, you know, that investigation probably took a little bit longer than it should have, and that kind of probably raised a few questions in terms of how does the business process work, how have we got the right accountability in place and those sort of things. So I think like most people in this room, because of our backgrounds, would immediately think that perhaps a uh, SNOP process might be the solution to this problem. And here we can see, you know, the basic four-step meeting that you see in a monthly SNOP cycle. In this case, we've got PLM, Product Lifestyle Management, because of the importance of technology for this company it could be a new activities meeting, the demand review, supply review, and the exec SOP. Um, and we would agree, SNOP would be the right solution to this problem. Um, but as a firm, we have another view as well in terms of SNOP for us isn't just that monthly meeting structure and how that rolls. And most people in this room would probably have that sort of understanding as well, but certainly when you speak to kind of other executives outside of the supply chain field, they might not, when they think SNOP, they might only think about those meetings. So I want to talk a little bit about something else that we would consider as core and essential to delivering the sort of results that Carly spoke about earlier today. So a question, and uh, I, once again, I feel like I need to apologize here. It's a little bit corny, but uh, I thought I'd go with it anyway. Originally I had picture of three little pigs' houses, but anyway, we just went with this one instead. What does building a house and implementing SNOP have in common? So we can have a little think about that, a little thinking music, perhaps, Muzak, we should put on. Um, here's a hint with the Leaning Tower of Pisa there. Yes, that's right, both need solid foundations. So if you don't have a solid foundation to your SNOP process, um, you won't get a lot of value out of those four meetings. And uh, we've seen that before with some of our clients that have implemented an SNOP process because, um, you know, quite rightly, the CFO or the CEO said, oh, I had an SNOP process in the other firm I worked. I want one here. And they try and throw one in. Um, but you need to do a little bit more to make sure that that's going to be a success. It's not just about the, that mon monthly meeting cycle. It's also about all the work that goes into making sure that they're productive and successful. So this is GRA's supply chain excellence framework. Um, this is how we, in a nutshell, would look and think about supply chain. So GRA works in the areas of supply chain strategy, um, planning or operational planning, which is all about SNOP, and also execution, which is more about the traditional logistics areas of supply chain. And this kind of like summarizes kind of like our view of the world. Up the top there, you can see a business strategy. Okay, so most businesses will have a strategy, a three to five year sort of plan in terms of what they want to do within the market. Um, that might be growing their, um, going national, increasing their product range, whatever the case may be. What's really important is whatever that business strategy must translate to a customer value proposition. So why does the customer come to you in this space? Okay. Business strategy are typically quite well defined in most companies. The customer value proposition often isn't. Um, but, but, we, but we really need to understand in very detailed terms what the customer value proposition is in order to deliver the right supply chain strategy. So some of the things you want to think about when you talk about a customer value proposition would be, for instance, what level of service are we going to provide? So how responsive are we to our customers? How willing are we to have stock outs? Okay, those sort of questions will then inform how you want to set up your network, whether you want to outsource activities or insource them. And then you can see down there to the bottom right, um, that will define your network and infrastructure where you're going to actually invest your capital. That then gives you the structure in which the SNOP is trying to optimise. So you have a net network which is reasonably fixed and the SNOP process is trying to deliver the best possible outcome within that. And that's where we move into the light blue and the purple. Um, the purple is what um, people frequently talk about and that's that, you know, that, that kind of meeting cycle. That's at the top, that's what I'd call the framework. Um, there we have the SNOP meeting cycles, we have accountabilities, now uh, we often use the racy sort of approach. We set the KPIs, as Carly mentioned before. Um, but underpinning all that is a planning capability. And what we'd say there is that's the foundation. So the planning capability is that day-to-day, week-to-week operations that often the supply chain teams are at the heart of, but needing support from other departments, that actually feed up and into those meetings to make sure that the right decisions can be made. So typically what we would say is that the SNOP framework would be about 20% of the effort. Okay, so defining what those meeting agendas should be, who should be there, getting the RACI in place, getting the KPIs defined, and the planning foundation, where we're actually delivering the on, on the ground capability would be 80% of the effort. Uh, I have to admit, in, uh, in Telstra's case, this wasn't, wasn't uh, necessarily true, because as Carly pointed out, 
the management of stakeholder changeover was very significant. Um, so there was a lot of effort, and, and uh, Telstra is certainly a very, very large ship. So it might probably wasn't a 20, 80%, but you know, as a rule of thumb, that's the sort of numbers we go with. And I think this is an important thing when you um, are talking to people back outside of your particular area, um, and they say they want a SNOP process or an IBP process, is that yes, um, the meetings are one thing, but we've got to make sure we've got everything in place to support those meetings. So what are some ways to tell whether you have a solid foundation? Um, forecasts and supply plans recalculate daily. Okay, so what we're hoping there is that um, you have a, a systemised process and you get a new forecast. If you make any change to that forecast, a supply plan or replenishment plan will automatically update on a daily or nightly basis. Second, it is easy to articulate the cost of inventory. Once again, this is an area that we often see um, requiring some work with our clients. When we talk about cost of inventory, we're talking about the cost of holding inventory, a carrying cost in our, you know, in our industry's term and the cost of moving or flowing inventory or a receiving cost is a probably more textbook definition. Um, if, if you can't easily articulate the cost of holding inventory within your business, okay, and we look typically as a percentage, so most businesses would have a holding cost of somewhere between 15 to 25%, potentially much higher if you've got a perishable product or you need cold stores or it's a high obsolescence rate. Um, if, you can't, if you can't articulate what that is, then you can't really optimise your inventory because you don't actually know What's the trade-off between moving, flowing inventory throughout our network versus holding it and buying large sums? Uh, third, my team understands the concepts of DRP, MRP, and time page replenishment planning. Um, this goes back to the people question. So, you know, as supply chain professionals, most of us here probably, I won't say fell into the role, um, but we probably didn't think about that as when we were um, growing up in kindergarten that I want to be a supply chain professional as I get older. And that speaks to the fact that it's only now just getting some more professional recognition. But with that, there's been a lack of training within our industry. Um, and you want to make sure your people understand these fundamentals, because if they're not, they're probably not always making the best possible decisions. Fourth is if service level targets change, safety stocks automatically update. So once again, what we're trying to do here is that we, we manage the inputs and the outputs manage themselves. So if we go back to the customer service promise, what we're saying there is perhaps we have a customer service promise of being in stock 98% of the time. What you want to be able to do within your systems is say, I want a 98% service level and your safety stock should automatically fluctuate based off that number. Now, if that's not the case, then we've got a, what we call a broken link within our business processes. Um, as Carly mentioned, um, reporting is very important. Um, and what we try and look for there, that reports can be dynamically grouped and filtered. Um, you must be able to have that sort of flexibility within your SNOP process to respond to a particular question the exec might have. And if you can't easily modify your reports, then it could be quite hard to drill down. It also speaks to an inability to, to manage by exception if we don't have the dynamic reporting capability. Uh, Carly mentioned this one as well. <laughs> Thank you, Carly. Is master data ownership is very important. So um, once again, um, as in the supply chain, we re rely on many master data elements. So these things might be lead times, product lifecycle codes, um, costs, and it must be clearly defined who owns those. If it's not, then often we'll find that data is poorly managed. And finally, there's a daily, weekly heartbeat that is synchronised across departments. Um, so within a planning team, obviously we, we tend to follow a certain rhythm. So what we'll be doing is often at the start of the week we'll be looking at our forecast, maybe midweek we'll be starting to manage the replenishment plans, the purchasing plans, and towards the back end of the week we're starting to look at supplier management and those sort of questions and reporting. Um, obviously we need input from other departments throughout that period, so what we look for there is that we're getting the right inputs at the right time from those other departments, and that is well understood across the organisation. This is another way to assess uh, your foundation maturity. Um, I just picked three dimensions because they'd be pretty common across most industries. Uh, demand planning, inventory planning and supply planning. Um, often you can add other dimensions depending on what industry you're in. So if you're in a retail business, you might add merchandising planning for instance. Um, for an innovative company, product management might, would probably go through there too. And if you were to generalise, you could say, you, where do you fall into the laggard, average and leading buckets? In the laggard bucket, what we're really thinking about there is that we have um, systems and processes that are either ad hoc or highly dependent on individuals and quite manual. Okay, so that's typical signs of that would be having spreadsheets using kind of last year equals this year forecasts, um, basic min max sort of replenishment methodology. So really, if you're in that end, you're really at the kind of the bottom five to ten percent in terms of organisations. 
Once we moved to average, we started to standardise our business processes and systems. This is where we typically have ERPs that will do most of our replenishment planning um, and we'll have a certain level of sophistication. And then in the, the leading areas, when we're starting to implement specialised systems and we're starting to use more sophisticated techniques. What's important as we um, look at these different dimensions is that we try and raise them all across. So sometimes in organisations we might be leading the demand planning area. For instance, we implemented a specialist forecasting system, um, but that forecast doesn't flow through, the error in that forecast doesn't flow through to our safety stock settings, for instance. So in that sense, I think someone mentioned it earlier, uh, the Rolls-Royce, I think that was Matthew, you've got sitting in the shed. Um, we might have a Rolls-Royce, but we're not getting all the value out of it because we haven't actually connected it through to the rest of our um, planning decision making. So back to Telstra, sorry I got a little bit heavy on the theory there as I want to do. Um, what did we initially observe? Well we, we initially observed issues both at the framework level and the foundation um, level. Carly's already spoken to a fair bit about the framework issues but um, initially back when we started a couple of years ago um, the approval process for things was quite um, ad hoc so for instance that large purchase order um, it was a little bit unclear in terms of who actually owns certain forecasts or who signed off on certain de decisions. Um, and unfortunately, execs sometimes had to make decisions with incomplete information. There just wasn't that foundation feeding up the reports that they needed um, in a timely fashion. At the foundation level, there was gaps in the end-to-end -end planning process. So this could be seen particularly in that inventory planning process in terms of the setting of stocking policies. Um, there was constraints on trying to improve this due to outsourcing, which limited the business ability to manage master data. Um, and there was a short planning horizon of only 13 weeks. And obviously everyone in the room would be thinking an SNOP process should be at least a rolling 12 month horizon. Um, that's hard to deliver when you've only got a 13 week forecast. So what did we try and do to rectify that? Well, um, basically five areas we focused on. Obviously area one was the structure and frameworks, setting up those monthly SNOP meetings, making sure that the agenda was correct, having those KPIs that Carly referred to. Two was to enhance the planning process. So we implemented daily, weekly routines um, so people knew what they were doing on particular days of the week. Um, and second, start to focus on exception-based planning. So really just trying to put in systems that you can make, look at what you need to do when, look at what needs to be done based off um, outputs from the system. Third, and we're still in the process of doing this, is um, implementing a planning solution. So this planning solution is going to extend the planning horizon from the 13 weeks out to at least 12 months, possibly 24, depending. Um, implemented st implementing statistical forecasting, so using multi-algorithm tournament forecast selections to improve the quality of that forecast, um, and also implementing inventory optimization, so starting to use statistical safety stocks to set those inventory policies that were previously set by a, a days or weeks cover approach. And finally, um, improve that data foundation. So define the master data ownership, which Carly has been fantastic at delivering, um, and also a big job from Sally and Paul's team in terms of actually data acquisition and cleansing. The fifth thing was to provide some delivery support, support to the people. Um, this was done both at the structure and framework level where we participated in the first three SNOP cycles, and now Telstra have been running it for many, many more than that. Um, and also providing on the ground support to the team who were actually asking to do some new things that they hadn't done before. Second last slide, um, I, I, I picked this because I, I love the, the guy with the phone at the end. I thought that was really quite fitting. Um, let the process evolve. And I think this is another theme that's come through today as well, is that um, an SNOP process isn't stagnant. It's gotta be responsive. Um, that's one thing to draw from this slide. The other is to not wait for everything to be perfect because that perfect day will never come. Um, quite intelligently, the business decided that to pilot it with one business unit with a stakeholder who was identified as supportive of the process and to make it a success before rolling it out across other areas. That also gave us the opportunity to refine that process and so as it expanded out, um, it was of a higher quality and we would find less resistance. So, last slide, bringing it all together. Um, you're often told to only have three points in a, in a slide pack, but anyway, the first two are probably the same, if that's okay. So um, first is stakeholder buy-in, and, and Carly referred to that in her section. Um, obviously absolutely essential, and other speakers have spoken about the same thing today. Um, make sure that it is flexible and relevant at that executive level, okay? So Carly spoke about using forecast accuracy and how that might not have got the traction. Um, talking about cash flow was of much more interest. 
that's the example of being flexible and listening to what those stakeholders want and making sure that what we're talking about is relevant to them. Um, third is what I've been banging on about for the last 10 minutes is the SNOP Foundation, uh, not neglecting that and making sure people understand the importance of it. And the last one is don't wait for perfection. So um, you know, you've seen the results that have been delivered and those results have been delivered um, because we haven't sat back, but we've we got on the ground and went running and we fixed problems as they came up. So with that, I'm gonna pause and say thank you and see if there are any questions. The challenge around forecasting versus plans. So um, how do you manage between um, either a rolling 12 month forecast, 24 month forecast versus having a target? Um, do you have a target or is, is your target the forecast? Because what, what, are, you, what are you actually um, measuring the executives against? Okay. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise you'll always make your forecast, right? So you might as well not have a target. Yeah. Yeah, that, and, and that's a really, really great question. And it's, it's a cultural um, thing within Telstra that we're just on the journey of changing at the moment. Um, some areas it's a, a lot easier than others. And, um, and the tack that we're taking is very much a, um, this is what the, the stats and the data tells us. So if we look at past history, if we're looking at the stats and the data, this is actually what it tells us. And then let's add the events and the changes and the competitive activity and the cannibalization on top of that. But let's start with the, the uncleansed, oh, well, the cleansed forecast and then add from that. And then once we've got that, let's have a look at, you know, what the percentage of the sales targets are and, um, and are they aligned or are they misaligned? And then let's actually try to understand that and then have that conversation. Um, many at times a very robust conversation um, as, as to what, what that is. But I, I, I need to be honest with you and say that we're still very much in the embassy of, of absolutely um, educating our business on this uh, because traditionally um, Telstra hasn't owned a lot of its supply chain. And so now that we, we've actually brought in a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the experience within the team, um, all of a sudden the channels are going, oh, um, what do you mean that I can't have 10 units per store? And, I, and then we go back to them and say, but every single other time we've launched a product, it's only two units per store, guys. So what's the delta? And then they go, oh, oh okay, well, maybe it's two units per store. All right. So, so it's just educating them. And, and, and I cannot emphasise about winning people's trust. And once you win their trust and show them um, how we're actually there to help and support them, then they actually start to come on the journey with you. Um, but as you can see, I demonstrated the number of stakeholders that are changing over at the moment. It's a constant battle and it's a constant thing that we have to keep on, keep on doing and keeping on showing the results and keeping on, sh on, I guess, showing them the forecast accuracy results of when they actually look at us for support. Okay, I accept it's that. Yeah. Yeah. So our way, it, it's a, it's a, like as Carly said, that's a really, it's a challenging, challenging problem. Um, the focus initially was just on demand and supply balancing at a unit level. Um, what the business is trying to do is bring those activations in, um, and you can think about those activations maybe in, in, like as a sales budget. And so there'll be, a, so what we're now trying to look to do is there a delta between the number of activations and what our demand unit forecast is. The trick with this, though, is that you've got to consider the fact that some activations are with existing mobile phones, some are with BYO devices. Um, so, so it's got that added complexity of thinking about those two other factors and trying to trying to work that through. So, there's, you know, we talk about big data and stuff. That's a, definitely a big data opportunity there. Yeah.